Good morning. Uh, we're at 15 hours and 30 minutes and counting, and uh, this is the ASIM pre-flight uh, refresher briefing we have with us to discuss the assembly of uh, station by uh, EVA Methods, Mr. Bill Gerstenmeyer, who is the ASIM operations manager for this mission and is also a manager from our Space Shuttle Space Station Freedom Assembly Operations Office here at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, we'll take a briefing from uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer and then we'll take your questions. Bill? Okay. Thanks, Jeff. We'll go ahead and get started. We'll put up the first chart, please. Um, the ASIM purpose is to uh, demonstrate and assess proposed Space Station Freedom Assembly concepts and techniques uh, we're going to focus on concepts that are difficult to analyze in our ground-based simulators, and we're also going to try and get uh, uh, tasks or activities that have major procedural impacts on space station freedom or have design impacts on it. I think everyone's pretty well aware of what the purpose is for ASIM. Uh, what I'd like to do with today's briefing is to try and take this purpose and show you the actual ASIM tasks, uh, describe them a little bit in detail, and show the relationship of the actual Space Station Freedom Assembly to some of the uh, ASIM demonstration tasks. So I'll show you uh, kind of qualitatively how these actual assembly tasks and freedom relate to the ASIM demonstration. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do today is to go into a little more detail than has been done on the past and what, and what the specific ASIM tasks are and, and talk to you a little bit about the kind of data we're trying to receive from each one of the ASIM tasks. Uh, the ASIM methodology is uh, basically the way we're going to get data. Most of the data is qualitative, uh, and it consists largely of, of crew comments. The kinds of comments we're looking from the crew for are uh, workload type comments, uh, task feasibility, is it a feasible task, is it doable? Uh, we're looking at the time to accomplish the task. Uh, there's a lot of photo and TV documentation of the individual tasks. And then also, lastly, I guess we're looking at whether the task was completed or not completed. It, it's valuable to us, even if we don't get through a task, don't complete it. That's important information that we can use for the, uh, for the assembly of space station when we put together our procedures and techniques. The way we built ASIM was we chose representative uh, space station freedom assembly tasks. Uh, and, and what we did is we chose, the, or we used the criteria that I talked about in the purpose page to choose those tasks. Uh, we chose tasks that were difficult to simulate on the ground, and we chose tasks that had high impact potential on station. If it had a large time driver in space station assembly, and it was important for us to understand how long it really took to, that ta took to do that task in space, we chose those type of tasks for the ASIM demonstration. Um, and again, going back to the, the data we're collecting, we're going to do the same task multiple times. It'll be formed by various crew members. We'll slightly vary the techniques. We'll slightly vary the conditions of the task to try and get a good qualitative feel of, of how easy it is to do that task, um, how, how reasonable it is to do that task in space station assembly. Now I'll switch and I'll, I'll go into the specific ASIM tasks a little bit and we'll, we'll talk about those. The primary task or the primary objective of ASIM is to demonstrate three EVA day capability. That's three six-hour EVAs. Uh, we're going to do that by using the one Intelsat EVA for the first uh, EVA. Then we'll use two days dedicated to ASIM activities. And that will make up the three EVA days. In terms of application to station, um, every, every space station uh, freedom task uh, involves, or every space station freedom assembly flight involves some amount of EVA. Um, our goal in space station freedom assembly is to have two days of EVA for assembly and maintenance. The exact split between assembly and maintenance is re relatively arbitrary. This time, if we need, we can use the full two days for assembly and sacrifice some maintenance at this point. But right now, our goal in freedom is to try and get the EVA tasks down on each assembly on station down to two days. Uh, in our current assembly work, um, our, we're on track for that. Almost all the assembly flights on 1 through 7 are down to two EVAs. Uh, the fifth assembly flight on Space Station Freedom involves three EVAs at the current time, and we're trying to scrub that and, and, and shrink it down to two EVA days. What we're doing here with ASIM is we're going to understand what our ability is to support three back-to-back -back EVAs, and then that gives us some margin above our two-day EVA goal for Space Station. 
the, the kind of data we get back from the, the three-day EVA evaluation is we learned an awful lot of this pre-flight, and, and I've stated in the chart that's a majority of the data. That may be a little bit of an overstatement. But we learned an awful lot about the training requirements for training two teams of EVA crews. Uh, we learned a lot about the cross-training of those crews. Uh, does every crew member need to know all the tasks that they could perform in a contingency in the next EVA, or do they need to know a subset? This gave us a, a good feel for what our trainer loading is going to be like for space station assembly flights. Uh, it just gave us a good rundown of what the training requirements will be for assembly flights. We also wanted to look at the onboard storage of our EMUs, that's the spacesuits that the crews wear uh, when they go EVA. Uh, prior to this, we'd only had the capability to carry three EMUs. Uh, for this demonstration, we had to look at stowing that fourth EMU on the orbiter, and we found a location for it and, and got it into the orbiter. Uh, the kind of data we're going to get from flight is we're going to get some human factors type data, um, what it's to, to work uh, essentially an EVA, then have a day off, and then work another EVA. We'll get a, a feel for what the task is for three fairly demanding EVAs in terms of workload and understand how much uh, work that is to the crew. Uh, we'll gain a lot of information on the storage in the orbiter. As I talked about earlier, where we have the four EMUs stored now, just from a livability standpoint, there's now another large spacesuit floating around in the uh, orbiter uh, mid-deck. So how that impacts stowage and, and cr crew kind of factors on board will be important for us. We'll also get some feel for the adequacy of the, t the training. Um, I talked earlier about the, uh, the training requirements, the cross-training. We took our best guess at how we would do that for space station assembly flights. We're looking for feedback from the crews on how adequate was that training. Would it really allow them to back up another task? Would it not? Did they get enough in-depth knowledge? How well did our simulators train to do the tasks, et cetera? So we'll gain a lot of information on flight on how well our simulators and how well we can train for the assembly tasks. The next ASIM task is pallet installation. Uh, it's going to be demonstrated by by picking the impest pallet up and attach it to a fixture. Uh, the fixture is built with uh, Langley joints and nodes and uh, assembled truss structure. Yeah, that's the first thing you'll see uh, on the EVA. The first thing we do is, is we build the fixture. The fixture's primary purpose is to serve as an attach point for the, for the impest. We tried to minimize the amount of time we're building the fixture. Uh, it's good general EA knowledge. But the fixture doesn't relate, relate directly to station. It gives us some good feel for just EVA tasks. But its primary purpose is to serve as an attachment point for the impest when we bring it up and attach it to the fixture. So we minimize the time it takes to build the fixture by cutting it down from a cube to a pyramid, removing some of the struts. We also leave the fixture up overnight between the EVAs so we don't have to take the overhead and time of tearing it down and building. So again, the fixture's purpose is to serve as an attachment point. It gives us some general EVA information, but it's not, not critical to our operations, or it's not, not a critical demonstration of a station task. Um, we're going to do the impasse atta attachment to the truss twice, uh, one, twice per EVA day. We're going to use uh, three techniques, three different techniques, and one of those techniques is repeated, or we'll actually do it four times. We'll do it with min compliance, which is the minimum compliance in the fittings between the truss and the fixture. We'll do it with full compliance, which is a lot of leeway in both angular misalignment and also X location. Uh, that's an easier task. We'll do that once in each EVA. And then also we'll do the eight leg attachment, where now instead of having just four attach points, we'll actually have eight attach points. Uh, in terms of uh, application to, to freedom, this is very representative of the module to trust installation. And I'll, I'll show you in a, in a minute a picture of what it looks like on Space Station Freedom Assembly. Uh, it'll give us information on how well we can find position the RMS. Uh, it'll sh give us some information that may impact the design of the module to attach system. Right now we're going through a, a pre-CDR design of that system, but the information we obtained from ASIM on how well that attaching works to the, the module will impact the design. Uh, the kind of data we're looking for is the relative positioning ability, how well we can position the, the impest with respect to the uh, fixture. We're going to again get task feasibility and complexity, and we'll get some comments uh, on the Y-joint capability. Was there enough compliance in the Y-joint? 
This, the picture you see on the screen right now is from uh, the fifth flight of Space Station Freedom Assembly. Uh, the large module you see being picked up in the bay uh, on the upper right hand view is the, is the node on Space Station. Down in the left hand corner you see the shuttle arm positioning the node with respect to the integrated truss. That is completely analogous to what we're going to do during ASIM when we pick the MPES pallet up and we're going to position the MPES pallet with respect to the, the fixture that we built. Then go EVA in both station assembly and during the ASIM demonstration and the EVA crew members make final attachment of the node to that module to truss structure attachment. So the tasks are very analogous for what we're going to do in the assembly. The mass is slightly higher in the space station assembly world. The positioning of the arm is very representative and the attached type device is also very representative. Okay, the next thing we're look at is uh, an assembly area evaluation. Uh, what this is, is this is where we're going to do the EVA with respect to the orbiter. In the past, all our EVAs have been done in the payload bay with payload bay floodlights, a relatively warm environment because there's a lot of structure around radiating to the EVA crew members. When Space Station comes along, we're going to do a lot of EVA out over the nose, and I'll show you a picture of uh, a minute where the EVA work sites are on Space Station. So what we're doing here is we're going to take the ASIM legs, which were used to attach the MPES pallet to the fixture, we're going to position the MPES out over the nose of the orbiter, and we're going to stow those legs. We'll stow them in two positions out over the nose uh, on the first EVA, and then on the second EVA, because of time drains, we'll only do it once. When we're up in that region, the crew's going to be stowing the legs, doing a real task. Uh, they'll be evaluating lighting, they'll be evaluating thermal conditions. They'll be reading some decals to see how well they can read in that region. And we'll get a lot of information of operating a new regime outside the, uh, outside the orbiter payload bay. So we'll get a chance to practice EVA in a new location uh, with respect to the orbiter. Um, the other piece of data we'll get is, and you'll see in the picture in a minute, that the space stage thrust sticks out over the orbiter nose and blocks a star tracker on the orbiter. We're also going to pick up information on how well a star tracker can perform with the truss in a close proximity. And those trackers are used on the orbiter to keep our IMU platforms aligned. So it's important that we know how well that performs when a truss is in close proximity. We talked about previously, uh, we're going to look for lighting thermal crew comments. Uh, also, we're going to look for IVA crew comments. What can the crew members inside the orbiter see when the EVA astronauts are out in this region. How well can they see them? How well can they monitor the tasks they're doing? How well can we, uh, can we see what's going on uh, by the orbiter uh, closed circuit television cameras? We'll take a lot of photography in this region to document first how well the EVA crew member can see and also how well the IVA crew member can see the EVA crew member. In preparing for this task, uh, we, we learned a lot in, in the fact that we hadn't really done EVA in this region of the orbiter. We had to do unique management of some vacation antennas up in that area to keep the, uh, the RF radiation levels down within the suit capability. Uh, we also had to work some procedures to inhibit the forward RCS jets to ensure we don't have contamination on the uh, EVA crew members. So from a pre-flight standpoint, we learned quite a bit about working in that region and making some modifications to existing or procedures. This picture shows uh, the MB-1, or the first flight of space station assembly. Uh, again, you can see the orbiter there, and that's the first piece of space station that will be built. The EVA astronaut is out at the end of the uh, pre-integrated truss piece. Those large stowed up boxes you see out there are the solar array that will be extended on the second flight of space station freedom assembly. What the astronaut does on the first flight is he goes out in this region, he deploys the beta gimbals, and prepares those blankets and solar arrays for deployment on the subsequent mission. So you can see here, here's an EVA astronaut in this work site actually doing a task on space station assembly. When you see the video later with the uh, ASIM demonstration, you'll see that the MPES truss is out in, in a very similar location to this. There's also some ASIM demonstrations done back closer to the uh, crew cabin, and again, there's some work sites in space station freedom that are, that are represented by that. The next ASIM task that we're going to look at is uh, mass handling. Uh, this is how well uh, an EVA crew member can handle a large mass. Uh, we're going to use the MPES with without the fixture attached to it, 
It'll be picked up by a, by a crew person. We'll do one of these handlings on, on each EVA, one with the impest and then one with the fixture on the second EVA. Um, after the handling demonstration is done, how well the astronaut can position and move this around, we'll look at birthing these, uh, the, the impest and the impest plus the fixture back into the bay. And I'll show you a video that explains that and shows that a little bit better. Uh, but what we're going to investigate here is how well an EVA person can translate, manipulate, and maneuver a, a, a large mass around. Uh, when the fixture is attached, as you'll see in the video, and also a wet F picture, uh, there's a significantly different position where we're going to mate that down in the bay. It's uh, significantly moved in CG, and it's also a much larger volume. So we'll get some feel about how the, not the necessarily the mass, but the actual volume of the uh, article we pick up uh, impacts the crew member's ability to manipulate it and maneuver it around. Um, again, on application to Space Station Freedom, there's many orbital replacement units planned for Space Station Freedom. ASIM's going to provide valuable data on the EVA person's ability to handle, translate, and install these ORUs with robotic assistance. So we'll get a, we'll get a feel for how well we can actually manipulate these devices around. During the ASIM demonstration, we determine what's appropriate for an EVA crew member to do on Space Station Freedom Assembly flights and, and what's not. Some tasks uh, may be done on a contingency basis on Space Station Freedom Assembly, or they may be inline assembly tasks. Uh, I think some prime examples of components that could be manipulated via EVA are the mobile transporter batteries. They're about a refrigerator-sized device that weighs about 1,000 pounds. They provide power to the station arm and to its mobile transporter. They're currently planned to be uh, EVA installed or a uh, manipulator installed. Right now, probably EA is the candidate, and this is some good information on how well we can handle a large mass. Um, there's also some control moment gyros that are uh, an ORU to be changed out on a contingency basis, and those also are an example of some components we might have to move around on station. The kind of data return we're going to get is, again, we'll get some crew comments on how well our ground simulators uh, we're able to simulate the actual demonstration in flight. I'll show you again some pictures in the wet F demonstrating the mass handling with the fixture attached, uh, and we'll get a chance to get some crew feedback on how well our simulators mimic the real task when they did in space. Uh, we're also going to take a look post-flight uh, with some video analysis, analysis of the impest rates. We'll take the camera views, we'll take it in an offline sim, and we'll actually look at the rates that it was able to impart and take out in manipulating and moving these large masses. So we'll get some quantitative data from the video post-flight with some analysis to understand what the rates they are. We can then compare that with crew comments about how well they felt they were controlling it and how fast they were manipulating it. So we'll get kind of a one-to-one comparison of what the human felt as he was moving it versus what the data actually shows in terms of manipulation. And, and as I talked about earlier, we'll also get a lot of information on how well we actually birth these large masses down into the payload bay. <clears throat> the next task is uh, EVA crew assisted RMS birthing. Uh, what we're going to do here is as we stow the impasse in after each EVA and we're ready to go to the next day's activity, uh, we're going to take away some of the, the cues from the RMS operator. We're going to instruct him to not use the deal data that's available to him, ask him not to use the video data but just have the EVA crew essentially voice direct him as he, as he stows the impest down in the bay. Uh, we'll also back that up and add digital data as it's required when the crew member feels he needs to do the task. We'll also have EMU TV available in one of the demonstrations with the voice uh, call as well as he births it. Um, you'll see in a minute there are many RMS berthings planned on Space Station Freedom. Uh, examples are the, the trust to trusting, propulsion module installation, cryo carrier installation, and, and a whole variety of maintenance tasks. It's uh, really impossible for us to, to locate uh, the uh, number of cameras that we need in all the locations uh, where they need to be. So what we're going to do here is we're going to gain data on how well the EVA crew member can assist the RMS operator in performing these tasks. And there's some potential here of keeping down the number of cameras required on station. Uh, we're also going to get some information on the performance of the EU TV for photo documentation. With Space Station, this is the first time a, a spacecraft is going to actually be assembled in orbit.
Typically, this photo documentation is done down at the Cape as the assembly is built up and close out photos and documentation so we can go back and see how the actual design was built. The question now is in space station assembly, how much photo documentation do we need to do on orbit as we're actually building the station? The EMU TV mounted on the helmet of the EMU will provide an excellent source of that data. Uh, we'll get a chance here in the ASIM demonstration to see how well we can really use that or what the video quality is. Is it sufficient for looking at connectors or is it only good for gross, gross or large tasks? Again, the data return is very typical of what we've seen before. It's the task time, what cues they need when the RMS uh, operator needs to add these cues back in, and again, general crew comments. The next picture is kind of difficult to see, but the arm is installing a propulsion module onto Space Station Freedom on the second assembly flight. Uh, you can see here the solar arrays are deployed on Space Station Freedom. That's what you, you saw the EVA guy preparing to do on the first flight. But the key point here is that where that propulsion module is installed is well out of the view of any closed circuit TVs on the orbiter. Um, right now, we're, we're going to have a, probably a dedicated boresight camera to do that propulsion module installation. Uh, the crew's ability to assist in that by a visual voice calls uh, will be important in determining how many cameras we need in that region and what kind of uh, guides and cues we need to do that task. So this, the, the berthing of the impasse is fairly analogous to what we're going to be doing here when we're installing a propulsion module on station. Okay, the, one of the other tasks we're going to look at is the crew self-rescue. Uh, the crew is going to use multiple devices uh, to assess their ability to stop their motion and also to translate. Uh, the devices they're going to use are the crew propulsion device, uh, the inflatable pole, the bi-stem pole, a telescope pole, and an astro rope. I'll show you a video with some of those in a minute and you can get a chance to see what those look like. Uh, the EVAs and the evaluations are really scattered throughout the EVAs. Uh, the crew is always tethered when they're doing these demonstrations, not like they would be when they actually needed, when this capability was actually required, but they'll always be tethered during these. And these tasks are fairly small and fairly compact and take a, a fairly small amount of time. So you'll see these evaluations scattered in throughout the EVAs, and they're a prime candidate to move in uh, to any time we have some slack time in the EVA or there's some other, other downtimes in the EVA. Again, uh, the application to freedom is, in the past, when we had EVA astronauts from either a broken tether or a missed tether connection, the orbiter always had the option of going to fly out and rescue the EVA person. In the case of Space Station Freedom, the time to undock and come off of, space, uh, off of Space Station and then go rescue the crew member is so prohibitive that we can't get to the crew member in time. So for Space Station Freedom assembly flights, some additional crew self-rescue capability is, is desired. What we did here is we took candidate concepts were chosen from the available equipment, things that we could, we could find that are around that we could demonstrate. Uh, the real system that we choose for station will probably be significantly different, and by that I mean in the packaging. The concepts we're looking at here, the pole, the propulsion device, etc., are good concepts, but the actual package and actual use of these will probably be different when we actually go develop a system for station. Uh, and the last point, probably the poles that you see, even though they may not be used crew self-rescue, they'll also provide an excellent translation aid. Uh, as you saw earlier when I showed the, the node being, or the module being installed on Space Station Freedom, uh, there's not a lot of translation handholds around that device. The poles could be used as a translation aid on Space Station Freedom to get to areas that we hadn't planned to get to originally. And again, our, uh, our data return will be the video analysis. Again, we'll look at how well we can arrest rate and stop rate, and again, general crew comments on, uh, on how it works. What I'd like to do now is, these are some pictures from the wet app. I'll use these as lead-in to a computer simulation, and then we'll, we'll roll the computer simulation. It'll show the ASIM EVA tasks as they're done. Uh, this, this shows the fixture initial assembly starting in a payload bay with an EVA not in the wet app in our, in our swimming pool, starting to assemble the truss. Uh, the important things to pick out on the, uh, on the MPES pallet itself are the two node boxes. That's where the nodes are stored to build the uh, truss fixture. In the center of the pallet is a grapple fixture that will be used to pick the impest pallet up by the shuttle arm. And then stowed on both the front and the back of the, uh, the truss are the uh, legs and, and the fixture that we'll use to attach. 
The next picture, if we can get it up there, shows the, uh, again, shows a wet F demonstration. This is the fixture fully erected. I won't show you this fixture being erected in a computer simulation. And this shows the impasse, the, the large pallet attached at the bottom, attached to the fixture. And the EVA crew member is actually standing at the bottom of the wet F. And what he's doing in this demonstration is he's taking the impasse pallet and the fixture and simulating berthing into the orbiter. And you can see here uh, a unique aspect of how we had to modify our, our training and our facilities to fit this equipment in. Because of the size of the impasse and the fixture, we could no longer have the cargo bay laying along the bottom of the pool, as you've seen it in many pictures. What we had to do here is we had to rotate the cargo bay vertical in the pool, stick the cargo bay out, put the crew member on the bottom of the floor to simulate the task of berthing the uh, fixture into the, into the payload retention latches in the cargo bay. So this shows some unique aspects of how we had to modify facilities to train this task. And we also plan to get some, some very good feedback from the crew on how well what they did here in the wet F relates to what they're going to do in flight. How well did, it, how well did we get it neutrally buoyant? How, well did it was, how easy was it in the wet F compared to how easy is it on orbit? So we'll gain a lot of data of comparison of our two facilities with the actual uh, in-flight demonstration. Now we can go ahead and, and start the uh, computer simulation. And these are the tasks described previously, and these will be as they're done on, uh, actually done on the ASIM flight. This is the, the mass handling demonstration uh, done on the first EVA. The, ar the arm, the uh, impest pallet is not to the crew member nor the arm. The only way that that impest pallet is held is it's by the EVA crew member and they're putting in the rates and the, the movements into the impasse. And as I talked about, the, the rates will be uh, analyzed post-flight and we'll get a feel for what kind of rates we could, we could put in, what the EVA crew member could put in. Now we'll take the impasse pallet, we'll install it back in the payload bay, again with the EVA crew person serving as the interface between the arm and the pallet. And you can see the fine positioning finally going into the guides. And that simulates how well an EVA crew person can berth. These are two of the uh, crew self-rescue devices. Uh, the astronaut down in the bottom is using the crew propulsive device. It's a nitrogen set of thrusters that he'll use to manipulate and maneuver himself around in the bay. Uh, the astronaut at top is using one of our poles uh, to help with positioning the astronaut prior to release. We're going to try and start out the, the crew propulsive device uh, demonstration with as small a as possible on the EVA astronaut. We're going to actually back the orbiter away from the EVA astronaut so there's no impart rates when he starts. And then he's going to use the, the gas jet to, to put in some translation and see how well he can precisely control that. And again, with some comparison of how well it works on our ground simulators, the air bearing floor compared to in flight. The next task is we're going to install the legs on the front of the impest pallet. Uh, these legs will be installed and then they'll have the Y fittings I talked about earlier. The Y fittings will then be used to attach the impest pallet to the fixture, again simulating the, the node to trust installation or module to trust installation on Space Station Freedom. You can see here they're attaching the legs to the, to the front of the impest pallet. There's uh, eight legs that will be attached. The eight legs are then joined at the top by a Y fitting, which you can see here in this, this picture up in the top. And the impest pallet will be manipulated and maneuvered, in, maneuvered into the, uh, to the fixture, to the front face of the truss. And this is the crew member attaching one of the legs to the Y fitting. This is the pallet installation task we talked about. There's four places where the pallet attaches to the fixture we built at the beginning of the EVA. Uh, the crew member, again, directs the RMS operator to bring it in within about two inches or so. We'll look at this several different ways. We'll look at it with minimum compliance, full compliance, and then we'll actually bring it in with, with the eight legs, where the, uh, we'll look at making eight fittings instead of just the four. The crew member then tightens down on the, the Y fitting, as you can see here, and attaches the, uh, the MPES to the fixture. You can also see the astronaut a portable foot restraint that's mounted to the truss structure. This is a chance for us to take a look at the portable foot restraint and how it attaches to the structure. This is the stack handling demonstration that you saw in the wet F picture. This is the astronaut on the end of the arm actually picking up the impest pallet with the fixture attached to it. 
again we'll take them up over the bay and then we'll manipulate the, the mass. This has about a 500 pound increase over the previous uh, mass handling demonstration and more importantly the attachment down in the bay is now dramatically different than we saw before. The other attach point was very close to where the astronaut was, was uh, operating or holding onto the pallet. This attach point will be more remote and located further out. Again, in both these demonstrations, the uh, steering wheel that's used as part of the uh, uh, Intelsat demonstration will be used as the handling device between the crew member and the pallet and, and truss structure. And this, this portion of the video shows the actual demonstration you saw in the wet F photo where we're going to insert the uh, trunnions of the fixture into the payload bay latches and then, then finally tighten it down. This is the EVA assembly area evaluation. This is uh, position one where we're going to go ahead and stow those legs. Uh, again, we're out over the orbiter nose. The crew will be giving us comments on how well the lighting is in that region. Uh, they'll give us comments on the thermal ability of the suits. Is it warm? Is it cold in that region? There's also some decals they'll be looking at in that region to see how well they can read and, and see fine positioning kind of details. On the second EVA, we'll actually do a lighting demonstration where we'll turn off all the cargo bay lights, turn off the orbiter lights, and just use the uh, EMU uh, helmet-mounted lights to do the task and see how well they, they provide lighting in that area. This is a prime worksite station. Uh, there may come out of this some additional requirements for lights in that area. This is the second position that will be demonstrated for uh, leg stow. This is a position we'll go to on BVAs. We stow the remainder of the legs out in this area. Uh, we'll also pick up, as I talked about earlier, some information on how well the star trackers perform with, uh, with the truss in that region uh, over the nose. In these during this demonstration, the RCS jets will be inhibited. The drivers will be turned off on the forward RCS. Uh, so there's no, no problem of uh, any thruster firing, firing while the crews are out over the, uh, out over the forward RCS. And again, we're stowing the remainder of the, the legs here in this, in this area, picking up lighting comments, thermal comments, and also IVA crew member comments on how well they can see astronauts in this position and how much assistance they can give them. This is a, a EVA-assisted berthing. This will be done at the end of each EVA home. Again, we'll use the crew member located here up on the upper corner of the pyramid with their EMU TV to provide one of the cues. Uh, we'll also provide some, some voices from that area on how well they can see, and we'll get a chance to see how well we can, we can berth a, a large payload into the... This is the telescoping pole that's manually deployed. It's one of the crew self-rescue devices. Uh, we'll use those in a variety of ways. We'll look at attaching them to the fixture that we talked about earlier. We'll also attach them to some of the handholds on the MPES pad down in the bay. This, again, this shows, uh, uh, again, positioning using another one of the poles and using it as a translation aid, how well you can translate on the pole, how well you can stop, uh, et cetera. And again, we'll use multiple targets with these poles. We'll use the slide wire uh, MPES handholds and the fixture. Okay, that completes the video. I think ASIM so far has proven to be a very valuable learning tool. Um, it's provided us a lot of insight into crew training and team concepts as I've talked about. Um, it's provided a lot of insight into our ground simulation capabilities. We've used a whole variety of simulators here. We used the wet F, the, the swimming pool, we used the air bearing floor, we used the manipulator development facility, we used the uh, shuttle mission simulator in combination with the wet F. We've got a chance to really use all our facilities just like we're going to have to use them for stations. So it gave us some important information on loading for those facilities and on how well it takes to train. Also, uh, ASIM provided a pathfinder for processing of flight hardware. Uh, many of the space station components are going to be built by McDonnell Douglas. Uh, McDonnell Douglas uh, built the ASIM hardware here for us and they had a chance to process flight hardware in their Kerr Lake development facility here. It's the first time they saw flight hardware. We got to bring the, uh, the ASIM hardware through here in a, in a manner very analogous to what we're going to do with the Space Station Freedom actual hardware as it comes, comes through JSC. It'll be brought here to JSC, outfitted, and then shipped to the Cape. So this proved as a, a pathfinder for that hardware processing and gave McDonnell Douglas some experience in processing flight hardware. 
It's also given us a tremendous amount of insight into to planning for the, the complicated Space Station Freedom Assembly missions. I think when you look at the tasks that we're going to do on Space Station, the EVA, the RMS activities, the activation and checkout, assembling a large space structure in space, there's a lot of challenges there, a lot of fun, a lot of good work, and ASIM has provided a good proving ground for a lot of those assembly concepts, techniques, and procedures. I guess in, in final summary, uh, I think the ASIM team is really looking forward to receiving some flight data on these concepts, seeing how well it compares to, to where we are uh, with our, our simulator facilities, um, and we're really looking forward to the ASIM demonstration. Uh, I think ASIM has really proved invaluable for us uh, for obtaining uh, information on a proposed uh, complicated, challenging space station freedom assembly flights, and we're really looking forward to getting the data so we can go forward and, and validate and verify some of our concepts for space station assembly. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, we're going to go straight to the Kennedy Space Center and take questions at the new center there, KSC. Uh, this is Craig Tavault with Aviation Week with uh, two or three questions. As they go through EVA, will they actually make time hacks, marks, if you will, when they start the task, and time marks when they finish so they can uh, get a, an accurate clock on each task? Yes, we will. We'll do that on the ground as well if the crew members will also keep track of, of their time as they're resting on the task. One interesting point is that the the people that actually put together the procedures for the ASIM demonstration are the same personnel on the ground that, will actually, that are actually now timelining and putting together the Space Station Freedom Assembly EVA times. So there's really a one-for-one -one transfer of information. So the person that's actually built the ASIM demonstration will get feedback on how long it takes to do a task. Then they can directly, the same person can directly take that data and relate it to the work they're doing in Space Station Freedom Assembly. So there's an assurance that the times we get in these tasks and the, the margins that go into timelines will carry directly from ASIM into the Space Station Freedom Assembly planning. Okay, and a little more uh, qualitative question, I guess. Uh, as you've gone through the, uh, the groundwork to prepare for ASIM, have you found the, the overall challenge to be about what you expected or, or more than what you expected? And secondly, just from a task point of view, what do you uh, believe the most difficult part of the ASIM EVA will be? Okay. I think in terms of our anticipated uh, uh, overall complexity, I think we've, uh, we're about what we expected. I think we, we didn't find very many surprises in the ground training and the simulations. I think we've adequately worked that. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how it compares with flight and see how it goes in flight, but uh, I think our, our workload and training was pretty much what we expected. As far as which task do we think is the most complicated or most challenging? I think one that's probably most important to us is the impasse to fixture attachment. That, that really simulates a, a critical operation on space station. Uh, attaching the node or lab underneath the, uh, the truss structure is, is very, very important to us. And, and how well we can position with the arm and how well we can do that attachment is really critical to, to where we are in space station. So that's probably the, the, the task that has the most payback and probably has some, uh, has probably the most challenge to it. We have uh, several ways of attaching it as we talked about. Uh, we have the min compliance and full compliance. Uh, I think we'll definitely be able to do it with full compliance, the ability to do the task in compliance or the eight leg task. Uh, those should be able to be done based on our ground simulations, but we'll, we'll learn in flight on, on how well it goes. This is Jim Bank, Florida today. Uh, in terms of the workload, we keep seeing on previous missions that you go through your timeline faster once you get on orbit. So in regards to workload, uh, do you expect to see that same sort of phenomena happen this time? And, and would there be any ASIM activities that you do during the first EVA if Inelsat rescue goes perfect? Uh, I think in general we expect to make up some time in the timeline as we have in the past. Uh, during the ASIM demonstrations we have some candidate tasks we can add in to, to do some things. Uh, we weren't able to schedule all the crew self-rescue devices. Uh, some of those will be good candidate fill-in tasks. They're fairly short duration that we can add in. Um, 
As far as the uh, first day EVA goes and the Inelsat, uh, if it gets done early and we have time to spare, there may be an option of doing some of the crew self-rescue during that EVA because, again, it's a fairly compact fairly compact task that can be broken or stopped at any point in its in its work. So that's probably the most likely candidate we would add in. Any other of the ASIM objectives I think are too involving of the crew time to be added in on that first EVA. And how much more of uh, this ASIM kind of activity do you anticipate doing in the next couple of years before you actually start building Freedom? I think we would, we would like to see at least one EVA type demonstration per calendar year if we get it in. Uh, ASIM is opportune in the fact that we're, we're prior to the, the critical design review for Space Station Freedom, so there is a chance that some of the information we learn here can impact the actual design. As we get closer into to station, uh, the task that we would do would be a slightly different nature. We can't really affect the design very much, but they would be more to validate and verify the specific concepts that we have planned for station. So in summary, I guess we'd like to add uh, one, one of these type demonstrations per year. It's not on the books yet, but we're in the planning process of trying to get that added. Hi, Robert Stewart with the Los Angeles Times. In addition to the qualitative comments uh, from the crew about their experience with a, a, a three EVA, what specific medical data are you looking for uh, as far as uh, having members perform three VAs in a single mission? Um, as ASAM Ops Manager, we're really not looking at any specific medical data. Um, the flight surgeons will review the data and provide their cuts to us as they do for nominal missions, and, and we don't, we're, there's no specific or no unique data we're capturing there that I'm aware of. This is Ocean on Earth News. Uh, how applicable is uh, your truss assembly to space station since the uh, space station is going to use the pre-assembled truss now? And what kind of contingency capability do you have for ejecting the truss uh, if uh, for some reason there's an MDF mission to between the second and third EVAs? Okay. As I, I tried to stress in my briefing, the primary purpose of the, of the, the truss we're building is to serve as a fixture, a fixture to simulate uh, module truss attachment. So what we tried to do there is we tried to minimize the amount of time that it takes to build that fixture up, but we needed a fixture to attach to. It, it provides general EVA information in manipulating long members, placing them into perlas, uh, doing a lot of hand tasks, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of wrist and hand motion. It can be fatiguing to hand, so it provides good general information, but it's it's not very applicable to the current design of space station. It's really only there to, to serve as a fixture. We minimize the amount of time it takes to build it by cutting down on the number of members, and we leave it up overnight also to cut down on the amount of tear down and build up overhead with it. Um, your second question was, do we have the option of, uh, of jettisoning it? I yes, we do. We can open the perlas and fly away from it if we have to close the bay payload bay doors and come home for a contingency of any sort. So we have the option of jettisoning it and getting rid of it if required. And the next set of scheduled EVAs is the Hubble MNR next year. Uh, what tasks are you doing that might be applicable towards uh, helping gain information for those EVAs? Again, I think in, in general, uh, I'm not familiar with the specific tasks that are on the Hubble mission, but the general applicability is the uh, ORU translation, the mass handling kind of demonstrations, the mating, berthing. Those tasks that were demonstrated on ASIM are really fairly generic in nature, and they apply to almost any maintenance or servicing mission. So how much an astronaut can handle, how, how well he can maneuver it, how well he can position it, how well he can slide it in, a, a berthing fixture and attach it. Those type of tasks have application to all the EVA tasks, be it maintenance for Hubble or space station assembly. And that's the last question we have at the King Space Center, and we have no questions here, so uh, we'll wrap this briefing up. Thank you very much.